One time a preacher filled in for another preacher. And after the service, he, was, he wasn't too far from the church, and he decided he'd walk to this motel. And so he went, started walking through town, and he somehow or another, he took the wrong street, went down the wrong street, and he got lost. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever done that or not. I've done that in these big cities. I've, when I was driving for Yellow Freight, I used to get out when I would stay over in these big cities. I'd get out and walk. Every chance I got, I'd walk the streets and sidewalks, and I got lost. And so he got lost in this little city, and he, so he was walking along, and he came upon a man, and he stopped him, and he said, uh, you asked him for some directions. He said, can you give me some directions? On, he told him the motel name, and, and, the, and he said, uh, the guy said, well, you're the preacher that I heard this morning. He said, I recognize your voice. And uh, he said, I'm blind. And so the preacher says, "Ah, oh, well, that's all right." I said, "I, you know, I'll, I'll go go somewhere else and get somebody to help me." He said, "No, no, no." He said, "I'll help you." He said, "I'll be happy to help you." And he said, "No." He said, "You," he said, "You're blind," and he said, "You can't. Obviously, you can't help me get where I'm going." He said, "Oh yeah." He said, "Don't. Are you going to deprive me of getting to help somebody here?" He said, "You know, everybody's so good to me." And he said, "Here's an opportunity for me to be good to somebody." He said, "Let me help you." He said, well, all right. So the blind man, he gets the blind man by the arm, and he said, they take off. And so the blind man, they, they talk, and they chit-chat along the way, and before you know it, the blind man had him in front of his motel. He said, there you are. He said, here, we're here. And uh, so they talk a little bit more, and, and so here's what the man said, which really got me when you start thinking about the story. So here's your hotel, he said, and so just as he started to leave, he said, uh, I live alone, and I can go all over these streets wherever I want to, he said, without anybody helping me. He said, I've learned how to do that, and I, I, I'm good at it. And then he said this. He said, I'm thankful for my blindness. And the preacher said, well, why are you thankful for your blindness? And he said, because when I went blind, he said, I spend more time at home meditating on the Word of God and thinking about godly things. And I thought about that this morning. It really got me. You know, when you think about what we do and how we go and how we live and just always in a hurry, always just in a, in a real. And I thought about that blind man saying, I'm thankful for my blindness that I, I take time now to quietly meditate on the Word of God. <coughs> and, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be time. You know, there's going to be a day when we get to meditate on God and His a great realm of heavenly realm every day. That's all we're going to have to do is meditate and work for God. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? So circumstances sometimes we may not be have a lot of gratitude <clears throat> and be thankful for some of the things we may endure, have to endure. You know, there's a lot of things we have to endure. We have <clears throat> a lot of painful things that may come into our lives that we just have to get over. We have to deal with. And so what we need to do is those things do come, and they will come, is that we, let's remember this blind man. Let's remember uh, his attitude. And let's take those things, those terrible things, hard things, and turn them around and even be thankful for them, that we've grown and we've used them to be better and to help us be closer to God and to help us think about meditating on the Word of God and let the Word of God discern our thoughts, as we talked about in class this morning. But, you know, I'm, I suppose that potentially, if you think about the church and Christianity and religion and the whole thing, it's probably uh, one of our great shames is that we exhibit ingratitude. 
<clears throat> I try to remind us every Lord's Day about the supper and, you know, we and be thankful for the supper <clears throat> that we can get to participate in it. <clears throat> be thankful for God and his son. And you can show ingratitude. You can certainly show ingratitude by not participating in the supper or taking it haphazardly and not doing it with a discerning heart and thinking about God and thinking about Christ and wherever your mind is. Ingratitude. So to have so much, you know, we do have a lot. I mean, we are blessed people and we are a blessed nation. And we certainly are blessed beyond uh, our wildest dreams as people. And we know that, don't we? we well, sometimes we forget about it, and we, we're not grateful for some of the things that we enjoy. And so to have all those things and, and not be grateful for it is a pretty terrible thought, isn't it? So we want to remind ourselves to be thankful and give thanks to God. We ought to sit down and make a list. You ought to do it sometime. I'm, ta I'm talking to me. We ought to do it. We ought to just sit down and just go to making a list of everything that, that I can be thankful for. You ever tried that? I, just, I was just sitting there this morning and I just started just in my mind just jotting down things. Well, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for the Bible. And you just go right on and on and on and on and on of the things that we could jot down that we can give thanks for. But what about blindness? Or sickness? Pain? Sorrow? Hurt? We... We forget all that gratitude then, don't we? And so, why did you do that, God? Why did you do that to me? You know? That, let's don't do that. Let's don't be guilty of that. So I sit down and do that sometime. Just try it sometime. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Paul said, <clears throat> We are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief on the truth. Paul was thankful for those brethren. Are you thankful for your brethren? Are you thankful for this congregation? Are we thankful for one another? I'm thankful for y'all. You don't know how thankful I am for y'all. I, I am so thankful to God that we have each other. And that we can worship together, we can study together, and we can work together, and we can play together sometimes. All those things are nice, aren't they? And I'm thankful. Paul was thankful for the brethren at Thessalonica in a lot of ways. And he expresses that to him, and he says, always, I'm thankful for you. And then in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything, give thanks not only for your brethren, Paul says, but everything. For this is the will of God. Can we insert the blind man there? Everything give thanks. The blind man said, I'm thankful for my, my blindness. Boy, he understood 1 Thessalonians, didn't he? Uh, 5 verse 18. And everything give thanks for this, and the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So <clears throat> I, I just got two points. And I want us to look at this idea of thinking about this, and we want to give you a couple of reasons why we ought to always give thanks to God. Number one, we've been made in the image of God. We talked about that in class this morning, and I really want to do that by design where you have it on your mind. In the image of God, you know, when you think about the image of God, there in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now you have the flesh and you have the spirit, right? 
And so when we think about that, what we talked about this morning, this idea of the image of God, of course, that's the spirit. We're talking about God's spirit here. And you think about the good news of the fact that this body is not the end. Image, right? We talked about that. We got that in your head. The, the good news to know that you, you're going to survive death from this body. You know, we're going we're gonna to put this old earthly shale off of the image of God, the, the soul, the spirit. Now, I don't know if you have really put that together with the idea of being thankful here. Are we thankful that God made us in his image? Absolutely. Because we have a hope of something after this shell is gone, this physical shell, this this tabernacle, this uh, receptacle receptacle of the spirit. And so, so there's good news that I certainly am thankful for the fact that this is not all. You know, Paul said something to that effect, didn't he? If if this is all we have, I think it's First Corinthians fifteen, somewhere on there. If this is all we have, this earthly tabernacle, and there is no life after this, we are of all men most miserable or pitiable. This is all we got to look forward to. And you, you might be thinking in your mind, well, boy, I enjoy my life. Really? I, I do too. But do you enjoy sickness? Do you, you, enjoy, you enjoy sorrow and pain and all those things is, is, is tagged to this flesh. That's why Paul said what he did. And that's why the Bible teaches us to understand and to recognize the fact that there is hope after this body. And I am so thankful that there is something after this hard life sometime we have to live on this earth. So we can certainly be thankful for the fact that we have been made in the image of God. And uh, uh, and not only that, it's going to be an everlasting thing once we part ways with this flesh. It's something that's going to be everlasting, never end. Where it is, First Peter one four to inheritance incorruptible. It, it cannot be done away with. Listen, if you're faithful to God and you stay faithful to God, you die in faith. Revelation two ten. This is incorruptible, an inheritance. Now, on this earth, we understand the fact that if somebody puts you in their wheel, they can take you out of their wheel. I've been in wheels that have been, have been taken out of them. I had a good friend of mine, he put me in wheel, told me, I'm leaving you everything I've got. He had a lot of money, too. A lot of money. And he got all messed up with a woman, and married the woman, and she had, to, had me took out of the wheel. She got all his money. That's okay. It's all right. But we can be taken out of wheels. It's, it's corruptible. This inheritance is incorruptible. It's going to be there. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. It's reserved. you got a reservation through the blood of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. You, when you were baptized into Christ, you put your reservation in for your inheritance. And Peter says it's undefiled. It's incorruptible. It does not fade away. Is that, does that help you? Boy, I, I tell you, I'm thankful for that. And that certainly goes along with my hope. That gives me hope and thankful. I'm thankful to God that he has, has set this. Jesus went there to prepare it. I go to prepare a place for you. That's it. Inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled. You don't fade away. And so I'm thankful for that. That's one thing we can certainly be thankful that we're made in the image of God. Now, being made in the image of God and trusting in the one God sent, I can be released from the fear of death. Do you fear death? talked about that a little bit we we have maybe a little fear of the unknown 
You know, nobody can describe to you death. They can't describe it. Because, <laughs> well, that's obvious, right? Uh, somebody said, well, I, went, I died and I come back. No. They might have went out under a little bit. Somebody said, they would die. listen, if you die, you ain't going to come back. I got news for you. You ain't going to come back if you die. You ain't going to do it. But so, so you can't describe death, but I don't have to fear it because of the one that God sent. And that was Jesus. Jesus made that possible. Hebrews 2, we've already studied that in our class. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, and through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and the deliverer, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus gives us a way then where we don't have to fear death. And so you can surmise and, 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 and worry about and think about all you want to. It's really a waste of time about what's on the other side. Don't do that. Don't worry about it. Just know that you don't have to fear it. That's a nice thought, isn't it? I don't have to fear death. And we, we, we have that blessing in the blood of Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. Well, number two then, Jesus cares for us. You know, I can't, I don't know that there'd be any more, any important thing for us to really recognize and remember that Jesus cares about you. He cares about us. You know, it's a terrible feeling to think about maybe the thought that nobody cares for you. I, I don't know that you've ever had that thought. Probably not. I don't know that I've really ever had that thought that nobody cares for me at all. But you know, there are people think that. There, you know, it's called uh, loneliness. Now, you've been lonely before, but not to the degree where you say, I'm so lonely, I know that nobody cares for me. You know, that's really at the very precipice of, of, of suicide. When you get to that point, you say, nobody cares for me anymore. I'm all by myself. I'm so lonely. I, I, I don't want to live. And you say, boy, that's pretty drastic. Well, it, it, it really is a thing. And, uh, you know, when COVID came, they, that's all you heard, right? Oh, people are, you know, they're people can become depressed and they're this, this and that. And they're, well, why? Because they were alone. They were lonely. They couldn't, they couldn't intermingle with people. One of the worst things that could have ever happened to the people was when they said, you can't get out. It, it started driving people crazy. Not to mention the things that it uh, done to the church along the way. But you, the old folks, people within the hospital, I mean, we experienced that with Jan's brother-in-law. He, he got COVID and he had to go to the hospital with COVID and they would not allow his family to go in and see him. Would not allow him to go in. I mean, he's up in the floor and fell down and skinned himself up and all this kind of thing. And they all, of course, they knew about these things and get reports that you can't go in there. About drove them crazy. It's so much so, even to this day, they have now a document, a federal document out for you to read. A 70-page document. There it is. Our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. The Surgeon General put this thing out in 2023. 70 pages of it tell you how to overcome loneliness and how, you, how important it is for you to intermingle with other people. Right the opposite of what our government was telling us a couple of years ago. You don't want to intermingle. You can't get out and intermingle. No, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you die. And you see, they, they, they're putting this literature out because it has affected people. Loneliness. And so, how can we overcome that in our thinking? Well, we know Jesus cares about us. You know, maybe that's part of the problem here. This epidemic of loneliness is the fact that they have over, overlooked one of the greatest blessings that they could ever enjoy in their life and have a partner for the rest of their remainder of days in Jesus Christ. Become a Christian. Let Jesus be your helper. Let God be your guide. 
And so uh, we, we can overcome those things. But as Christians, while we may have our moments of discouragement, we do get discouraged. Everybody has a time of when they get discouraged. But we know, don't we? We can never truthfully, or we shouldn't, ever say, nobody cares about me. Because God cares. Jesus cares. And we know that. Jesus is very plain in the Bible. is very uh, complete about the idea that he cares about us. Now, I'll give you this example. It's maybe a little bit satellite to this thought of Jesus caring. But it's, I wanted you to look at the, the context of this. Or look, look at it. It says, humble yourselves, therefore. Now, therefore is important. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, we use this. We take this passage. And there's nothing wrong with us using that for that this idea. Casting all your care. Now, that word care there is anxiety. Cast all your anxiety, all your care upon him. Who? Him. Jesus. For he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he devour. I wanted you to think, I, I said, I mentioned context. The context of that, of all things, is Peter addressing the elders and the flock. And so when you start reading through there, the therefore backs you up to the first of the chapter and you recognize that he has now started addressing the elders and how they are to lead the flock and how the flock is to follow the leaders. And he says, how are you going to do that? Humble yourselves. And in doing so, elders leading the flock, you're going to help these uh, sheep your flock recognize that they have help and recognize that the great shepherd is the Lord, Jesus Christ. Ain't that wonderful? Now that's his, his uh, address to a, a church, a group of people who needed help, by the way, in their time of trouble. They were living in the days of Nero and the uh, sore uh, 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 torment and torture of Christians and the persecution of God's people. They're right in the midst of it. And so, boy, you're talking about leaning on the fact that somebody cares about you and that you could depend on God and Christ to be there for you, be vigilant, casting your cares upon the Lord, be vigilant. Because of the devil, he's like a roaring lion. He wants to take that away from you. And he's going to use it. And he was using it on them, wasn't he? He was using it through persecution. He was using persecution to get to them. And so they, it might be very easy for you to think, and certainly in their situation, that they didn't have anybody care a thing about them because they were dying, being impaled on, the crawl, on, on uh, sticks and lit a fire in gardens for torches and sawn asunder, crucified, thrown out into the wilderness, to, stripped of their clothes, and they'd nick their skin, make them bleed, and throw them out in the wilderness where the animals would come eat them. That's Nero. Boy, can you, can, you get, can you relate to that and say, well, nobody care about me. I'm out here in the wilderness. I don't have a stitch of clothes on me, and they've cut my leg where I'm bleeding. Here comes an a, 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 a animal. He's fixing to devour me. Or in the arena uh, and about to face lines that they would just unleash on them in the arena. And everybody in the arena watch as they just ripped uh, their bodies apart in the arena. Christians. And you, you say, boy, ain't nobody here cares about me. God, you don't care about me. Right? But remember the blind man. Those people went down in those fiery graves that you see there. They, a lot of them went down singing hymns, praising God. They knew God cared about them. And they knew that the evil wickedness of the devil was the cause of what they were going through. And that they had, by the way, what was it? An inheritance 
that did not fade away. Incorruptible. Wait, no. They understood that. So we got to get this in our head. Well, here's another one. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, another one of our lessons that we've already looked at. For we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but it was all points tempted like as we were without sin. Yet without sin. So he, he understands. He cares. He can care about us, can he? Well, what about this? And you can't see it, but I'm sorry about that. I've made it too big. But Psalms 23. It's a pity that we, we have uh, restricted this to mostly funerals and graveside uh, sermons and such. But do you recognize that this, this is a passage that shows us how much God cares about us? Look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. There's one. The Lord is my shepherd. And I, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's somebody that really cares about me. And he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And watch it. Here we are. This is us. We're marching toward death right now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And we could insert there, I fear not death. I will fear no evil for thou, why? For thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's, that's a whole psalm about God caring for us. Every bit of it. And so think about that. God cares for us. And we should uh, be so thankful that Jesus does care for us. We are, are we not blessed by our Savior? Absolutely. We're so blessed. Makes you happy, don't it? Makes you so happy. So, so peaceful. Think about being blessed and so thankful. Last, and the last one. Here we are. Jesus is our propitiation. You say, man, what kind of a word is that? Propitiation. It's kind of hard to say, you know. But it's a beautiful thing. The word propitiation just simply means to regain the favor, if you look it up. So Jesus then is the one who reconciled us to God. Oh, he regained, we can regain favor with God, which by the way indicates that we have left God somewhere, and that's right, we have, haven't we? I mean, when you get the age of knowing what's right and wrong and you are an adult, you know that you've left God, you've sinned, and God, you're not with God. So we have to have a way back to God. And the Bible says that Jesus is that way. And he says that he, he is our propitiation in that word, our advocate, is the same word. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. Now, this is to Christians, by the way. This is somebody that's already been baptized into Christ. And John's writing to them. And so here's you, here's you some uh, work to do, brethren. We ought to try our level best not to sin. We have to go at it and say, I will not sin. And we have to go at it and say, I do not want to do things. And remember, take what you're doing. We learned this in class this morning. Whatever it is you're going to do, whatever it is you want to pursue, whatever it is you're partaking in, lay it there beside the Word of God and let the Word of God discern your heart. Let him, let him look at it. Say, here, God, check this out. I'm doing this. Is it good or bad? We've got to do it. Well, what's that mean? Sin not. That'll keep you from sinning, by the way. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man does, he knew this going to, didn't he? He knew that's going to happen. If any man sin, we have an advocate uh, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our propitiation. He is our advocate. And so <clears throat> that's a beautiful thing. That's something certainly to be thankful for. And we learn in Romans 4, 7, and 8 that our sins are covered. 
We learned in Isaiah that God says, I'm going to throw them out behind my back into the sea, never to remember them again. And Isaiah says they'll be like the, like the crimson. The crimson will turn into snow and wool. Clean. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? You know what that is? That's something that we ought to be thankful for. That's what that is. I am so thankful that my sins are covered up. They're covered, gone, buried in the, in the sea, behind God's back. And God says, I won't never look at them again. Over there, those over there. But now he's over here now, you got to work on them. Because John just got through saying, don't be sinning. And if you do sin, you've got to go to the advocate. Listen, that's the only way you're going to get your sins taken care of. You've got to go to the advocate because he is the propitiation. He is the one that brings us back in favor with God. And he's the only one and he's the only way through his blood and being baptized into Christ, becoming a Christian, being added to the Lord's body. Those things gives you the privilege of being able to go to the advocate. What a nice thought. He's our propitiation. I'm, I'm certainly thankful for that. Is that enough for you to be thankful? Oh, boy, I, it, it really is, isn't it? You know, one point of this lesson would be enough for us all to be thankful about things. Thankful for your blindness. And I, I, I can't get that out of my head. You know, I'm so thankful for my blindness. You know, I... It caused me to go home and meditate on the Word of God. So when things like that come along in our lives, bad things, hard things, rough things, terrible things, let's pray about it and, and take that thing and turn it around that we could use it to help us, whatever it may be. I know that's hard and I know that's easy to say, but we can do it through Christ and through God's help, with God's help. We have a lot to be thankful for as Christians. And we ought to remember that and hang on to that every day of our lives from here on out. A long time ago, there was a man by the name of Matthew Henry. He was a pretty well-known theologian. And he's walking down the street and he got robbed. And so he got, he, the guy took all his money. And so later he put it in his diary. He wrote a little note in his diary. And pretty curious at what he, what he said. He said, uh, let me th be thankful first because he never robbed me before. He didn't have to get robbed twice. And second, because although he took my money, he didn't kill me. And thirdly, because although he took all I possessed, it was not much. And fourthly, because it was me who was robbed and not me doing the robbing. I thought that's pretty curious that he put that in his journal, in his diary. Turned a robbery around and thank God that he was not a robber. How about that? Are we thankful this morning? I hope we are.